All right. Thank you for bearing with us as we get through our technical difficulties. So, as I said, I'm Dr. Carrie Cheney. I'm a dermatologist at the Medical College of Wisconsin and Frater Hospital. I'm going to talk about diagnosis and staging. So, my overview so, how do we diagnose a lymphoma? How do we go from skin biopsy to the diagnosis and then translating? that biopsy report into something that you can all understand. And then what is staging? What are the tests that we need to do to stage someone appropriately? Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about staging mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome because that has the best defined staging system. Um, and we'll just hit on how you stage other lymphomas as well, which is really more of a research tool. So diagnosing a lymphoma. So making a diagnosis is naming the problem and telling where it comes from. And we name cancers by the type of cell that they come from originally. So as Dr. Wood had said, a lymphoma is a cancer of the lymphocytes. And everyone always wants to know what's a Hodgkin's lymphoma, what's a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Virtually every cutaneous lymphoma is a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So a little bit of a history lesson. So Hodgkin's lymphoma were the first types of lymphoma cells that were really recognized when pathologists would look at cells under the microscope. And this is way before we had molecular tests and things like that. And then anything that was not a Hodgkin's lymphoma was called a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that designation still stands today. So Hodgkin's lymphomas are very, very rarely found in the skin. So most people with a cutaneous lymphoma will have some sort of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And lymphoma as a whole, now the cutaneous lymphomas are just a small portion of that. There's many other lymphomas of the lymph nodes and other organs. And there's about 82,000 cases of lymphoma, all comers, not just skin related, that are diagnosed in the United States. And about 8,000 of those per year are the Hodgkin's and everything else is going to be a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So also a little bit of a review from Dr. Wood's talk. So lymphocytes are a white blood cell. So their normal job is to defend us from different types of germs, so viruses in particular, and then they also protect us against cancers. They help kill off abnormal cells that happen just as a normal part of cells growing and dividing. Um, but they come from the bone marrow, which is where all blood cells start, and they start as a stem cell that then the body tells it what kind of cells we need more of. And one thing that they can become are these lymphoid cells, so the different types of lymphocytes. So B cells, T cells, and then the natural killer cells, like Dr. Wood said as well. And then there's other white blood cells that are also important for fighting off diseases. These are our neutrophils, platelets, which help us clot our blood, and then red blood cells, which help deliver oxygen to the body. So B, we define something as a B cell or a T cell by these proteins that they make and they stick on their surface that we can either do special staining for or filter using different machines in the lab. And so T cells make this thing called a T cell receptor. B cells make a B cell receptor, which is one of these immunoglobulins. And that is what You'll see this on pathology reports, or it'll talk about looking for clones of your T cell receptor. And this is sort of how we define whether you have a T or a B cell lymphoma by looking under the microscope and seeing which of those proteins is seen on the cells. So also a little bit of a review from Dr. Wood. So lymphocytes are everywhere in our body. They're like our armed services or our police force. They're patrolling through the body at the different interfaces where we may encounter viruses. They're searching for abnormal cells throughout our body. There's more in our skin than anywhere else, but they are also in our lymph system. So the lymph nodes and the lymphatics, the thymus where they kind of go to school to learn how to be a lymphocyte, the spleen, which is another sort of major organ that's full of lymphocytes and our bloodstream obviously as well. And as Dr. Wood said, more T cells in the skin than there are in our bloodstream. 
And it's when either these cells multiply out of control, like Dr. Wood said, or fail to die off, which is a normal part of life uh, for cells as well. That's when we have cancers that form. And then these are what we tend to talk about when we're talking about cutaneous lymphomas. And there's many different ways it can look at, like on the skin. So patches and plaques, the erythroderma, or when your skin is all red and scaly, tumors, and so when you come to your doctor with a rash or a lesion, at some point, someone has to say, we need to do a biopsy of this to figure out what it is. And so many of you have probably been through a skin punch biopsy, which I say is like taking the world's smallest cookie cutter and taking a little tiny core sample of the skin that then goes off to the lab. Sometimes you get stitched up. And then that biopsy goes into a jar and goes off to a pathologist, which is a physician, a doctor who has studied the abnormal responses of cells and their job is to look at tissue under the microscope and say what's wrong with it. And so that biopsy has a number of things that are done to it. So it has histology done, which, and I'll explain all of these in a moment, has immunohistochemistry done, and oftentimes we do gene rearrangement studies as well, and I'll explain all of those. So histology is studying the characteristics of a type of tissue. And so most of you probably had your skin biopsies looked at by a pathologist who has a special interest or special training in skin pathology. Just like we have doctors who specialize in, you know, that we have the oncologists and the dermatologists within pathology, they're often divided up. And there are some pathologists who focus exclusively on problems of the skin. And that can be really helpful to have that degree of specialized training to help you get a really good, precise diagnosis. So histology is the characteristics of skin and pathology are the abnormalities that can happen. And so the pathologists are looking at, are the individual cells abnormal looking? And then what is the architecture or what's wrong with sort of the normal structure that epidermis and dermis like Dr. Wood described. So immunohistochemistry is another specialized type of testing where we use antibodies to look for all of those different proteins that are on the surface of the cells to tell us what kind of cells are they, um, and then sometimes helps us guide treatment as well. So many of these proteins that help us decide what kind of lymphocytes or what kind of cells we're dealing with, especially in the immune system, have this name called CD and then a number. So different, whether you have, are a B cell or a T cell, they're gonna have these different CD proteins. So T lymphocytes, normally, most of them have CD3, and then they usually have CD4 or CD8. And as Dr. Wood said, so they're sort of the helper cells, and, uh, and that's usually what we see in mycosis fungoides. There's other types of T cells as well. And the presence or absence of these proteins helps us decide what kind of cells are there, and are they normal or are they abnormal. So there is this protein called CD30, which helps us define different types of uh, lymphomas of the skin. So as Dr. Wood said, the anaplastic large cell lymphoma or lymphomatoid papulosis, which is a more benign disorder of the lymphocytes, they are defined by having this CD30 protein in them. And then more recently, we have this drug brentuximab, which works by killing off cells that express CD30. So this particular protein can help us both define things and tell us some of the characteristics of people that may respond better to that kind of treatment. So on to talking a little bit about clonality, which for those of you who have a cutaneous T cell lymphoma, you may have had a study done on your blood or your skin that is called a T cell receptor gene rearrangement study. So clones in cancer, by definition, um, cancers, tend to be made up of clones, so exact copies of things. Um, but not everything that is a clone is cancer too. And so I don't know if you remember back, gosh, it's a while ago, Dolly the sheep was the first cloned organism. So it was 
a genetic exact copy or if you happen to be star wars fans like we are in my house there's the clone wars so the fighters that were all exact copies of each other so that's some way of you know thinking about clones that's a little bit less scientific but um in cutaneous lymphoma a lot of times we start with an abnormal cell and then it divides and it divides. And because they all have that same T cell receptor, we're able to pick out that family of cells that all came from that one abnormal cell that started things out. So the tricky part is not everything that is a clone turns out to be cancer. And in the skin, we see this a lot. There's all sorts of things like drug reactions or eczema and other rashes that can sometimes have a clone present and still isn't a cancer, which is one of these reasons that makes it so difficult sometimes to, uh, to define these people when you just have a rash and no one seems to be able to decide exactly what that is. So talking a little bit about the T-cell receptor, as I said, it is a molecule or a chemical that is made by T-cells and it sits on the surface and it is responsible for binding to things out in the environment and then it activates this T-cell to go do something. Um, it, you know, this is the, the scout out, it finds what it's looking for, it's out patrolling for something. If it finds it, then it may go back to the lymph node which is like the army base or the police station, and then it sounds the alert, and then things happen. Your body mounts some sort of response to that. That's how it should work normally. So all T cells have a little bit different receptors. So we have billions and billions of these different receptors because there's so many things that need to recognize to keep you safe and healthy viruses, um, different things that could be seen on abnormal cells. So it's like different keys. You know, it's like this huge keychain versus with different keys that will all unlock a different door. So as I said, the clones are all going to have the same receptor. So it's like having many copies of the same key. And we can look at those receptors to decide if there is a clone there and how big it is. Um, so, and we do this by, you take DNA out of the lymphocytes. So that can be from your skin or from your blood or from other tissues. And then they use this process usually called PCR, which makes lots of copies of the DNA so that they can look at it to see if there is a clone present. Now, if you happen to be someone who has a B cell lymphoma, we can do clones, clonality studies too, but instead of looking at the T cell receptor, we're looking at this B cell receptor, which is a type of antibody, and they look at different parts, this part called the heavy chain, which is the big part here, or the light chain, which is the littler part there. You can look to see if there's exact copies of that. Because just like the T cell receptor is out looking for different things, the B cell receptor is too. And so each B cell has sort of different, um, different parts here that help it recognize many different things. So instead of us just being able to do a test that says, okay, this is definitely a cancer, or no, this is definitely is not, the physicians, both the pathologist, the dermatologist, maybe the oncologist, we have to take all of this information and decide if it makes sense. So do the cells look like cancer? Is that immunohistochemistry typical of a cancer? And is there a clone? If all of those add up, then yes, this is a cutaneous lymphoma. But many times we don't have all three parts of that. And that's why sometimes it takes a while for us to be certain. And we like to be careful and not label people with a cancer if they don't have it. But this is why it may take years, why it may take multiple biopsies to make that diagnosis. So now when we have the diagnosis, we move on to staging. So staging helps us decide how extensive is the lymphoma in your body and in your skin. And that's helpful because it tells us what kind of treatment is gonna be most appropriate for you. And then it also gives us information about prognosis. 
Are you going to live a long and happy life with your cutaneous lymphoma? Or is this something that's going to need aggressive treatment to keep you healthy and well and um, alive? So when we stage, we look at different organs as well. So we look at the skin, we look at the blood, and we look at the lymph nodes, which are all these little green blobs that you can see through. They're in the arms, they're in the armpits, they're in the groin. There's the easy ones we can feel up in the neck, and then there's ones deep in the chest that we can't feel, and that's why we need things like CAT scans to look at that. So for all cancers, lymphomas and others, there's usually this TNMB system or the TNM for things that don't involve the blood. So T means the tumor, N means the lymph nodes, M means metastasis. So a metastasis is when the cancer has spread to a different organ than where it started. And then B is for blood, which is for the cutaneous lymphomas. I'm gonna talk really specifically about mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome now. So I apologize if you have a different type of lymphoma. This isn't gonna to pertain to you as much. I will hint at the other staging systems at the end. So T it does not really need fancy blood tests or CAT scans or PET scans to tell us. T is done by the eyes of your dermatologist or your doctor. And we have these different categories, T1 through 4. One is patches or plaques. So patches are flat skin lesions that you can't feel when you run your hands over them. Plaques are slightly elevated, like Dr. Wood said, like a mesa in the desert. Um, and T1 is if it's going to be less than 10% of your skin. You say, oh, well, gosh, how do you figure this out? So you're palm with your fingers is roughly about equal to about 1% of your skin surface. So we take a look and we kind of add things up in our hand to come up with sort of a gestalt of like, is this about, is this less than 10%? Is this more than 10%? So T2 is the same thing, patches or plaques, but covering more than 10% of your body surface. Now T3 is different. That is when you develop a tumor. So a tumor has to be at least a centimeter, and it's something that's usually quite deep, much more so than a plaque, almost as deep as it is wide, or it has a lot of substance to it. And then T4 is erythroderma. So all of our Cesare patients tend to fit in this category. So that erythroderma is defined as redness and scaling covering at least 80% of your skin. So for example, if you had these two spots, you would be a T1. If you're covered in spots that are patches or plaques, that's gonna be a T2. Tumors, that's a T3. And then erythroderma, that's a T4. So now N, so that's the T part. We move on to the N, which is looking at the lymph nodes. Now, um, so we'll feel for lymph nodes. And depending on how much skin involvement you have, you may or may not get a CAT scan. Not everyone necessarily needs a CAT scan, especially if you only have few patches or plaques. But um, so we'll feel for uh, enlarged lymph nodes, also the liver and the spleen, uh, CAT scans, and then PET scans, and I'll explain the difference of them. And then if you do have enlarged or abnormal lymph nodes, that may need to have a biopsy. And often more than just a needle biopsy, they may actually need to remove a lymph node to look at it under the microscope to make sure, is it lymphoma or is it some other reason that that lymph node is enlarged? And then metastasis, again, it's looking at other organs. So CAT scans and PET scans help us look at the liver, the brain, the uh, lungs. And those are places that cutaneous lymphomas can uncommonly travel to. So a CAT scan or a CT scan, it stands for computerized axial tomography. So what it does is it takes, it's really like thousands of x-rays and puts them together to make this two-dimensional picture of your inside. And it gives us a really good look. So over here, this is a person's lungs and heart in between. And we can see the lymph nodes, we can see the other tissues. And then a PET scan, mean, it stands for positron emission tomography. 
So this uses a little bit of radioactivity. So they take actually sugar, glucose, that has some radio uh, that has radioactivity attached to it, and it gives that to you through an IV, and it gives us information about metabolism. So glucose is the fuel that our body runs on, and so cells that are cancers, they're dividing, they're more active than sort of normal cells are, they need more glucose to survive. So they're gonna take up more of that radioactive glucose than the normal tissues will. And then we're gonna see if there's things that light up abnormally. So now there's other parts of our body that take up a lot of glucose, like the brain is running all the time, so that's gonna be really bright all the time. Our bladder, that's where we get rid of that. The kidneys normally take up a lot of glucose too. But our lymph nodes, which are here in this underarm, should not be taking up a lot of glucose. So here we have enlarged and active lymph nodes. So, and then down here as well. So that would be worrisome. So up here in the neck, this would be armpits, and then down here in the groin. So to give us, so there are these N zero through three, if we don't feel anything abnormal or see anything abnormal, that's an N0. The rest of these really require a biopsy for us to, to be able to say if it's abnormal or not, um, because it's defined by the pathology of the lymph node. And then metastasis, either you don't have it or you do have it, and there's an M0 and an M1. Rarely people may need a bone marrow biopsy. This is probably not too common, but that's where a doctor will insert a big needle usually into the hip bone to take out some of the bone marrow that's inside to look at under the microscope. And then B for blood work. So we do different types of blood tests. There's something called a CBC or complete blood count, which tells us how many lymphocytes you have and then it also looks at your other blood cells, your red blood cells, your platelets, how many white blood cells you have. There are things called an LDH, which sometimes is elevated if people have abnormalities of their lymph nodes or other organs. And then flow cytometry is often done, I do this on all of my patients, which is a way of taking blood and counting and sorting the cell, specifically the lymphocytes that are there in the blood, to tell us, do we see abnormalities in your bloodstream? So then there's this B staging system where either you don't have anything, you have a lot, which is what is Cesare syndrome, or you're somewhere in the middle. You have a little bit of abnormalities in your blood, but it's not enough to really call you Cesare syndrome. So flow cytometry, when this is done, it's we take the blood cells and then we sort them based on those proteins that they make and have on their surface. So if this is blood from, if these are the lymphocytes, my very crude uh, drawing here. Uh, so if we take someone with Cesare syndrome and we take their blood and then we take out the lymphocytes, we've got these normal cells, which are the CD4 cells. We've got the normal CD8 cells. So everyone has these, they're an important part of us. But then we have these Cesare cells, so the abnormal ones. And so in flow cytometry, using a bunch of different techniques, they're able to decide which ones are normal and abnormal. So normal cell, like I said, every cell has all these different proteins that they make. And cancer cells sometimes stop making some of the normal proteins. So sometimes we call that CD7. That's a protein that normal T cells make. CD26 is a protein that a lot of normal T cells make. And the cancer cells may not have those anymore. And that's one way to look for them too. So they may only have this CD4 marker left. So take the blood, they put in all these things, they spin it through this magical machine that gives us these fancy plots that the pathologists look at and tell us, so which ones are normal and which ones are abnormal. And then based on that flow cytometry, we can categorize patients as the B0, B1, B2. Then once we have all of those individual parts, here is the staging system. So here are the stages that you're used to seeing, one, two, three, and 
four, and then they're subdivided a bit more. And then you find where is the T, the N, the M, and the B, and then you work and find where you fit. So for most of, most patients are gonna be one A's and one B's. Those are people who have skin involvement only, no node involvement, no metastases, and not that significant amount of blood involvement. You can still have tiny abnormalities in your blood and still be a 1A or B. Um, so the 1As are the people who are going to have less than 10% of their skin with the scaly patches or plaques. The 1Bs are going to be the people who have more than 10% of their skin with scaly plaques. I'm going to skip 2A because it's pretty uncommon. 2B is going to be the T3 people. Those are the people with tumors. So if you have a tumor, you skip over the ones and you move to 2B. You still are not going to have significant lymph node involvement, no metastases, and no significant blood involvement. The stage threes are going to be the people who have erythroderma, so red and scaly all over, but not a lot of blood involvement. And then the fours are going to be people can have almost anything here. And there's a couple different things for A, B, or for A1, A2, and then for B. Um, so if you have a lot of blood involvement, you're going to be a four A1. If you have a lot of lymph node involvement, you're gonna be a 4A2. And then if you have any metastases, you're gonna be a 4B. That's if the lymphoma is in your lungs or your liver or your brain or another organ. Now, for those of you who don't have mycosis, fungoides, and Cesare syndrome, there is a staging system. It doesn't tell us as much about prognosis as we would like. So there are all of these other cutaneous lymphomas that are not mycosis fungoides or Cesare syndrome. Um, Dr. Wood went through all of them and all of the B cell lymphomas would be in this as well. So the problem is we've got many different types. Many of them are very rare, meaning sometimes there's only a couple of hundred cases worldwide of some of these types of lymphomas, and each one is very different and unique. It has a different clinical course. It has a different prognosis. So there is the general lymphoma staging system, which sometimes is used, and everyone basically gets thrown in one stage, even though their prognosis may be very different. And then in 2007, they tried to come up with a system for other cutaneous lymphomas that uses this TNM classification, but it doesn't tell us anything about prognosis. So T is it, so they have a T1, T2, T3, de, depending on do you only have one spot? Is it big or is it little? T2 is do you have a lot of spots, or is, but is it just in one area, just one leg, um, or T3, do you have skin lesions all over the body? And then this is sort of how they define the body regions. So right lower leg, you know, right upper leg, things like that. And then N and M, so N is do you have lymph node involvement or not? And then M is do you have metastases or not? but it helps us classify people. And then with this system, we hope over time, we may be able to have better prognostic information about some of these rare lymphomas that we just don't have as many cases of. So most of our prognostic information right now is based on the growth of lymphomas, which is what Dr. Wood mentioned as well. We classify into the indolent and the aggressive. So the indolent ones, tend to grow slowly. You may not even need treatment, especially for some of the B-cell lymphomas. And the, the big thing is these indolent ones and the mycosis fungoides and Cesare syn or the mycosis fungoides fits in this, they're usually not curable. Now, the aggressive lymphomas grow rapidly. Treatment is usually needed for survival. And these ones may be cured, not always. But so our indolent ones are mycosis fungoides, the granulomatous slack skin, which is maybe a subtype, uh, subcutaneous paniculitic T cell lymphoma, most forms of that, the anaplastic large cell lymphomas, and then some of these 
these two down here are B cell lymphomas, the cutaneous marginal zone and the cutaneous follicle center cell. And then this sort of unusual thing that we've actually stopped calling a lymphoma and are now calling a lymphoproliferative disorder. Then the aggressive lymphomas are Cesare syndrome, these NK cell lymphomas, the aggressive CD8 lymphomas, these gamma delta lymphomas, uh, some of these T cell lymphomas that we don't even have a classification for, and then of the B cell lymphomas, the primary cutaneous diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So, yes, question in the back. So that's a very good question because I think, you know, we were saying that oftentimes survival is less than two years for the aggressive lymphomas, and I think most of us who treat lymphomas will say we have patients with Cesare syndrome who have lived for 10 or more years with that diagnosis. And I think treatment has gotten better, which has helped with that too. We still consider it a more aggressive form, although I think there are people who it's not as aggressive as we have typically thought. <laughs> I think with, um, so over time, as we are getting better at defining what these cancers are, and we're classifying and reclassifying, like I said, so like this condition here, it's been reclassified like three times in the last couple, you know, the last 10 years as we're able to do more sophisticated molecular tests. So as we're able to see proteins or as we're able to look at DNA of things, I think over time we will be able to classify things even further. So based on, because there's also, you know, even with some of our patients with say a stage 2B mycosis fungoides, some people have very aggressive disease and some people have a much more indolent course. And so not, everyone in one stage is the same. And, but our current staging doesn't really tell us which are the patients who are going to do well and which are the patients who are gonna progress and have a more aggressive course. So I think that's where all of this research comes in by looking at DNA from different people, we're able to pick out some of the mutations that are associated with a more aggressive course and some that are gonna be more indolent. And we've had some of that information for a number of years now, but it's just not ready for being in the clinic every day yet. We need more, you know, more standardization on how that testing is done and then better information on predicting prognosis with it. I don't know if that's a good question. I think even within these, um, you know, these generalized indolent, you know, there's the people with 1A mycosis fungoides who will live happily for 40 years with their mycosis fungoides. And there's the people who are going to have uh, go very quickly from having patches and plaques to having tumors, metastasis, and dying. So even within the indolent, we have this very wide range of what happens to patients. Yes? Is it possible that those of us with CTCL have an issue with the thymus? Since the thymus is like... The, the education. So, well, so the... The thymus is where our T cells get educated, and actually it's most active in children, and as we get older, the thymus just sort of disappears almost, I guess. I'll, um, so is it a problem with the edge? So people who have thymus problems oftentimes have immunodeficiencies, so you know, the children who are in the bubbles and things like that where they're, they don't make a certain type of of lymphocyte and it makes them prone to a lot of diseases. But I don't think in the adult, the thymus doesn't play a real role. It's sort of in the beginning as we're children, sort of how our immune system gets educated on what it's supposed to do and how to react to different things. I don't know, Dr. Wood, do you have anything more wise to say about the thymus than I? Uh, certainly not more wise. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the thymus, yeah, the, the thymus is, uh, as uh, Dr. Cheney said, is mainly active very early in life. And if you 
you know, compare the size of the thymus of uh, uh, an adult to a young child, the child's thymus, even though they're overall much smaller, is way bigger than an adult. And to the point that uh, in uh, most of us, if they went looking for your thymus, it'd be hard to find. If a surgeon opened up your chest and was looking around for it, you know, they might f find a little vestige of it, but not, not very much. Um, so I don't think that um, a problem, you know, the, the peak age, are, to the best of my knowledge, mycosis fungoides has affected children as young as three, but it's, for most people, the peak age is about 60. So it tends to be disease of, uh, uh, shall we call it, middle age. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and because of, of that, I don't think that, you know, the thymus is playing much of a role at that point. Presumably, you know, people have been doing fine all along, all through childhood and young adulthood and, and you know, all the way up to that time. Um, so uh, it's a good thought. And there actually are some people that um, have in the past have had theories that the skin is actually a substitute thymus. Because if you look in the thymus, the thymus has uh, what are called epithelial cells, which are very much like the cells that make up the epidermis of the skin. And those are called thymic epithelial cells. And uh, there have been some uh, immunologists who've come up with these theories that uh, with a lot of uh, chronic skin diseases that, that, the, that the T cells are sort of fooled into thinking they're in the thymus. But all of those cells, as Dr. Cheney said, they've all sort of gone through their differentiation and development. They all have their T cell receptors fixed at certainly at the time they're, they're 60. And so uh, it, it's, it is something that other people have thought about, but there isn't really any good evidence that uh, there's anything wrong with your thymus when you're much younger that leaves you with this disease when you're much older. Thank you.